So in this video lecture, we will be talking about database keys, specifically candidate keys, primary keys, and composite keys. So database keys are a very important integral part of database tables because they are used to uniquely identify rows in a table. So you have to imagine a table and think of it as being made out of rows. If we need to uniquely pinpoint a particular record or a row, we use keys for that. Keys can be a single field or it can be a group of fields that are combined together to identify records. Um, keys can be unique or non-unique. We will mostly be focusing on unique keys. Um, some keys are also used to establish relationships between tables. Example are foreign keys, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Um, keys help to ensure the integrity of data. The role of key is based on the mathematical set concept of determination. We're not going to talk about those details, but just keep in mind that keys are actually based on this mathematical set concept of determination. For example, if we know that R determines Z, if you know the value of R, you know the value of Z as well. A good example of this is if you're thinking about a student table. Student ID can be considered a key because if you know the value of student ID, you can know many other details about a student. If you know a student's ID and if you have access and permission to look into a student database, you can look up the courses a student is registered for. You can look up their GPA and many other types of details that we are keeping track of. So again, keys really are an important part of relational databases because they really help us to identify particular records within a table. So we need to just kind of keep in mind to understand the difference between unique and non-unique keys. Unique keys means that um, you, you can uniquely identify a person using or a particular entity using that key, but you could also use other aspects to identify entities. Example is if you know a particular person's last name, you can identify them by their last name, but it's not unique when you're thinking about, for example, an employee table or a student table and last name is one field. It's not a unique field because you can have two people with the same last name. The same applies for a department. If you're thinking of department in the context of an employee table, you can have more than one employee in a department, so it wouldn't be considered a unique key, but you could still identify an employee by their department. Student ID, on the other hand, if you're thinking about it in the context of a student table, would be considered to be unique because you don't have two students with the same student ID. Date of birth would be non-unique because you can have many people that share the same date of birth. SSN or social security number would be considered unique because you don't have two people with the same social security number. So there are different types of keys and we are going to start by talking about the candidate key. So a candidate key, again from the name, it means candidate, which means it's a set of all keys in a table that are eligible to become unique keys. So let's look at an example of a student table here. You have student and we are keeping track of all these fields, student ID, SSN, date of birth, address, email, telephone, tax ID. What set of fields are eligible to be unique? Of course, student ID, SSN, and tax ID, because we know that no two students can have same values for this. So you can uniquely identify a student with these fields. But even though an a student can be identified by their address or telephone, we don't really use that. We cannot claim that to be 100% unique because you could have two people that, two students that have the same address or even telephone number in the system. Email, some people could say that it is unique, but we don't really like to use email as a part of a key because sometimes emails could change and emails could also uh, be inactivated and a new student comes in and could get the same ID, email ID. So we really stay away from using emails in terms of keys. So we can say that these three fields are unique in this particular context. So let's look at another example of identifying candidate keys. In this context, we have employee as a table and we are looking at employee number, SSN, first name, last name, department, email, phone extension. 
Now, I do have a business rule or assumption that's listed here, and this is very important uh, because for different uh, businesses, you could have different um, and rules that would change their candidate keys. So it's very important to carefully read the rule that says that there are no two employees with the same last name and phone extension. So you would not have in this particular context, two employees that share the same last name and phone extension number. So based on this, what would be some possible candidate keys that we can identify? So we can say that uh, we have three possible candidate keys here. Um, we have employee number, SSN, last name, and phone extension together. This is based on the assumption here that there are no two employees with the same last name and phone extension number. So based on that, we can say that employee number is one possible candidate key because no two employees share the same employee number. Social security number is another candidate key. And then last name and phone extension together is a candidate key. So there are three possible candidate keys in this scenario. So the next type of a key is a primary key or a PK. This is very important because the primary key is one of the candidate keys that is selected to uniquely re identify records in a table. So if we go back to the student table example that we were looking at, although student ID, SSN, tax ID all qualify as unique keys, we pick one key to become the primary key. And in this context, we pick student ID because primary keys are best, um, are, are, as a best practice, we want to use primary keys that are short and numeric. We have to consider privacy and security aspects as well when we're selecting a primary key. We want to stay away from using fields like social security number and tax ID because we have to think that primary keys are what people are going to use to identify themselves. So a student calls the registrar's office or any other department where they want to get services for, most likely they're going to be asked for their identifier student ID so that we can look further into the student record. We don't want to ask for SSN or tax ID because these are more secure and considered could be uh, you're having more layers exposed. So we want to keep that minimal. So from a privacy and security standpoint, picking SSN and tax ID would not be a good idea. Of course, we need to keep track of these uh, um, fields because they are important in terms of a student context when we are keeping track of student records. But when it comes to picking a primary key, you are thinking about a key that people or software applications would have to give out or use to query the database. So we want to pick something that's short and numeric and that applies within our organizational context. So another example here is with employees, like we have you know, a number of different candidate keys in this context as well. But we're going to pick employee number to be the candidate key. And in relational databases, when we are representing a primary key, we always underline the primary key. So when you look at this relation here, we can say that this is employee table. It has all these fields here that we're keeping track of. And employee number is considered to be the primary key because we have it underlined here. So let's look at more examples because an important aspect um, of relational tables is to also look at a table and be able to successfully identify candidate keys. So in this case, we are looking at customer table and we are keeping track of all these fields about a customer. We also have an assumption or a business rule that no customers who have the same last name and start date in a particular zip code. So we don't have two customers who share the same last name start date in a particular zip code. So recall that candidate key is a set of keys that are eligible to be primary keys. So in this case, we can say that we have three possible candidate keys. One is customer ID, the second is customer SSN, and the third one is customer last name, start date, and customer zip combined together can be a candidate key based on this assumption. So we have three candidate keys here and which one will we pick to be the primary key? We're going to pick customer ID to be the primary key. 
Finally, we are going to talk about composite keys or composite keys. When you have a key that's composed of more than one attribute, we call it a composite key as well. So in this case, for example, if we're going to look at that employee example that we looked at, we identified employee number, SSN, last name, and phone based on the assumption as the three possible candidate keys. We can say that last name and phone extension, this particular um, candidate key is also called as a composite or composite key because you have more than one attribute that's combined together. So if we go back to the example that we were looking at in terms of customer, this third candidate key here that includes customer last name, start date, and zip would also be considered as a composite key because it consists of more than one attribute. So when would composite keys be important or be used? Uh, typically, we pick as a primary key the key from our candidate keys that are short and numeric, but there could be instances when we do not have such a key. So let's look at this particular table here where we are keeping track of project ID, assignment, and start date. Project ID by itself cannot be a key because you have um, repeating values or it cannot be a primary or candidate key because you see that you have repeating values of project ID. 110 is repeating more than once. When we look at assignment, the same applies. You cannot have assignment because you have the same number that's repeating more than once. And start date, of course, is not a good key. So in this particular situation, if we, we have to again go back to the business rules that really define this, if we say that each project does not have repeating assignment values, we can combine project ID and assignment together to form a primary key which is unique. And that would also be called as a composite key because it includes more than one attribute. Um, here is another example of where a composite key might be um, used. Again, if you're keeping track of patient ID, prescription type, and status, and we look carefully, we have repeating values of patient and prescription. But if we have a rule that each patient can have only one type of prescription, we can combine patient ID and prescription type together to form a primary key, which is also a candidate key. And in that case, we can call that key as composite because it includes more than one attribute. So to recap, we have talked actually about three keys here. We have talked about candidate keys, which are the set of all the keys in a table that are eligible to become the primary key. The primary key is the one key or the set of key that we pick to become the primary key of a table. Composite keys are keys that include more than one attribute.